Hello guys, good morning. You are welcome to my YouTube channel, The Explicit Tutorials. As you all know, my name is Tutor Joseph or Mr. Explicit. Please, as you are watching this video, do subscribe so that when I upload any content, you'll be notified by YouTube. Secondly, I want to use this opportunity to thank my subscribers. I'm very, very happy for the positive impact you've had on my YouTube channel. I really appreciate that. God bless you immensely. And if you know you are yet to do so, please do it quickly. It is very important. I will blow very soon though. Eh? I'll remember you once I blow. I'm not saying I want to explode eh? once I blow, you know now. So please subscribe, like, share and comment, okay? And in today's video, chapter one of this course, EB111, I thought chapter one that would be that easy for students, but most of the students have been disturbing to take the, the topic. So by God's grace, I've promised them, I've promised you guys I'll take this topic to the best of my ability. So please do not just enjoy it all alone. Share it to your friends who are also in need of this topic. If you are if you are preparing for jam, uh, NECO, GCE, and other Virox exams, you also need this topic. In fact, this topic is like one third of the full biology, all right? It is very, very important. You have a deep knowledge of what this topic is all about. All right, so let's jump into the topic. Very easy. Now, the topic is ecology and ecosystem. Ecology and ecosystem. There are two, there are two terms, say, ecology and what? Ecosystem. Now, ecology, which is the first term here, was first coined by a German bi uh, biologist. By a German biologist. The word ecology was first defined by a German biologist named Ernst Haeckel in 1866. That, that was in the early 19th century. So he was the first German biologist to have given the meaning of ecology. His name is Ernst Haeckel. In 1966. Now, ecology is actually coined from two Greek words. Ecology is coined from two Greek words. All right, we have a uh, echo and what logi. All right, logi means what study is that not correct? Echo is just like environment. All right. So, if I don't use this word, environment can also be said to be oikos. Now, if I just say ecology is a study of animals in relation to their oikos, it is a study of animals in relation to their oikos. I'm trying to say that ecology is a study of man in relation to their environment. Oikos also means household environment dwelling place please ecology is a study of uh, animals in relation to their environment that is the meaning of what ecology now ecology has different concepts that are called ecological concepts that is what we are going to treat now the first place to coin this to give or to define what ecology is is an uh, echo in what year 1866 all right, don't forget I said ecology is coined from two Greek words. Echo could also be said to be oikos, then logic is was study. So it is a study of man or animals in relation to the oikos or environment. So that is the first step that, that has to be taken. Now the second term of the board is ecosystem. Ecosystem. Now the word ecosystem connotes the the that is ecosystem is like the study of living things and non-living things and their what interaction. Ecosystem comprises living things called biotic factors, non-living things called abiotic factors. So a branch of biology that is concerned with studying living things and how they interact with non-living things in their environment is called ecosystem. 
Eco data is the knowledge of the study of ecosystem boils down to three major key points. Scientists study ecosystem based on two criteria. One is based on what flow of energy. Flow of what energy. Now flow of energy has to do with what pyramid of energy. Pyramid. Pyramid of what energy. Pyramid of what energy. And so nutrient cycling. Nutrient cycling. Which of the following are the two are the are the two key uh, importance of studying ecosystem? One flow of energy called what pyramid of energy, and two nutrient what cycling in nature. So please take note of that; it is very very important. Now the next point is going to be based on the components of ecosystem. I told that ecosystem is made up of living and non-living factors or components. Now, the, the living factors or the living components are called biotic, biotic components. The biotic components include uh, the autotrophs. If I don't call them autotrophs, I'll call them producers. If I don't call them producers, I'll call them green plants. Not just plants, green plants. Now these guys, they are autotrophic in form, in the sense that they have the ability to produce their own food with the use of sun, with the use of carbophoroxide, water, mineral nutrients, and enzymes in the presence of what uh, sunlight and what chlorophyll. You should take note that. Photosynthesis occurs in the chloroplast and not in chlorophyll because the chlorophyll is just a pigment that enhances what photosynthesis. So please, we have autotroph autotrophs producers of what green plants. Another is heterotrophs. Heterotrophs. I open the bracket. I write consumers. Opposite of autotrophs is called what heterotroph. Now these these are consumers mainly animals that do not have the ability to produce their own food. They depend on the autotrophs for survival. That is for nutrients. All right. Now, but now under these heterotrophs, you have uh, you have um, you have omnivores. Okay, to be specific. All right. Uh, Parasitism, parasitism, mutualism, symbiosis, common, commensalism, all right, holozoic, holozoic. Now, under this Olozoic, under this Olozoic, you now have what is called Omnivores, Herbivores, and, okay, you have Carnivores, you have uh, Scavengers, all of these, these four are under Olozoic nutrition. Now, scavengers are animals that feed on dead animals, like vulture. Vultures feed on dead animals, all right? Dead and decay animals. Omnivores are animals that feed on all things, all right? Good plants and animals. Example is what? Rat, man. Herbivores are animals that feed on herbs, such as grazers, goats, sheep, cattle. Carnivores are flesh-eating animals. They feed on flesh. Now, it is not only animals that are carnivorous. Some plants are also carnivorous. Examples of plants that are carnivorous are uh, we have we have uh, the butterwort, the bladderwort, the pitcher plant, and the venus flytrap. All of them they are insectivorous or carnivorous in form because they feed on insects. All right, so. 
that is for that. Of course, you know what this one is, parasitism. It is a feeding association in which a smaller symbiote called parasite feeds on a larger symbiote called Cause what? Uh, called host, yeah, by causing him to eat. The mutualism is a beneficial feeding relationship in which the two parties benefit from each other. So it's also called what? Beneficial feeding association. All right, a type of uh, symbiosis is called what? Mutualism. All right, commensalism is a type of feeding association that exists between a larger organism. Uh, in which is a smaller one feeds on it and please take note that in comm commercialism none of the organism is harmed all right one ben one benefits the other also what benefits all right example is in fact it's only one that benefits the other one does not benefit okay that is the relationship between shark and remora fish the remora fish sticks itself to the guts of the remora of the shark so that any food particles that fall from the mouth of the shark is eaten by it, okay? So please, that is for that. Willozoic is a type of nutrition in which an organism obtains its food in the form of what? Solid. So please, omnivores, herbivores, carnivores, and scavengers are examples of what? Willozoic feeders, okay? That is for that. The third one, don't forget we are treating biotic components. The third one is um, decomposers. Decomposers. Please, under this heterotrophs, we also have what is called saprophytism. Alright, saprophytism. Alright, saprophytes. Saprophytes are the organisms, where saprophytism is what the association. Now, what are the composers? The composers are organisms that actually bring about the, 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 the breaking down of certain organic what, matter. Examples of the composers are termites, termites, beetles, uh, maggots, earthworms, earthworms. Bacteria and even saprophytes, such as uh, let me use what fungi. Fungi, you have uh, the mushroom, we have uh, the muco, the rhizopods. So, all of these are good decomposers. Please, there are three major components of there are three major biotic components of the ecosystem autotrophs, heterotrophs, and what decomposers. All right, so under heterotrophs. You have this, all right. That is this are uh, what you have under the trophic uh, component. So that is for that. Take note of that. Now the next one is the abiotic component. All right, a living component. Don't forget living component. Now the abiotic component comprises the physical and chemical factors in the environment such as sunlight, temperature, pressure, humidity, and so on and so forth. Turbidity, uh, transparency, they are all abiotic components of the ecosystem. So we have treated the biotic and abiotic components. So permit me to introduce what is called food chain and food web. Food chain and food web. Food chain and food web. Food chain, food chain is a linear. Look at the word. It is a linear feeding relationship in which nutrients are uh, transferred or transported from one trophic level to another. Nutrients are carried or are transferred from one trophic level to another. The region where an organism occupies in a given food chain is called trophic level. Another name for trophic level is called the feeding level. So the region or the particular place where an organism is found feeding in the food chain is called what? It's called trophic level, also called what? feeding level. 
So this is what linear feeding uh, relationship in, in which nutrients such as energy, uh, water, food are transferred from atrophic level to another. All right, take note of that. Now we have we have uh, we have grazing food chain, grazing food chain. All right, you have uh, grasses. You have goats, and you have what? Lion. Now take note that in a food chain, the organism after it feeds on the one before it. The organism after it feeds on the one before it. If I want to give you a broader uh, uh, linear illustration of what a grazing food chain is, I will say grasses. All right, grasshoppers, grasshoppers, I'll give you a toad, I'll give you snake, I'll give you hawk. All right, I can also write lion. All right, so this, this one is also grazing food chain, all right? But this one is also called the food chain. Now, this first guy that is being fed upon by this one is called the primary, is called the producers. Pro, this they are called producers. Why the one that feeds directly on the producers are called primary consumers. Primary consumers. Alright, primary consumers. Why the one that feed directly on the primary consumers are called uh, uh, secondary secondary consumers? Secondary consumers. Why the one that feed on secondary consumers are called tertiary tertiary or top consumers? Top what consumers? Uh, none of this, you know, they are carnivores, right? So please take note that the first trophic level comprises producer, the second trophic level uh, primary consumer, and so on and so forth. So what I have here is what the grazing food chain. Another one is detritus, detritivore food chain, or detritus food chain. All right, this. Are animals that feed on uh, that is decaying organic matter such as fallen leaves. I have here, mm, okay, fallen leaves. Tamarts and scaly ants eaters. So what I have here is what. The treaters uh, food chain and here is what the grazing food chain. So please, that is what you have it to be very, very easy. What we just treated is what food chain, but clusters of food chains, you have the word food web. Clusters of food chains is called what food web. In other words, when two or more food chains are interconnected, are joined together, you have a complex feeding relationship called what? food web. All right, food web. The word here is complex. All right, complex. But this one is what linear. When two or more food chains are joined together, you call it what food web, and it's actually what complex. I can also say that food web is a network of interconnected food chain. All right, it's a network of what interconnecting food chains. All right, and please take note that nutrients definitely are transferred from atrophic level to another. All right, so please take note that. So, oh, look, this. So please, just part of the noise coming from the background, please, sir. Uh, just focus. Now, let me illustrate, let me give a short illustration of how the food web looks like. 
I have grass. This area is very important. I have uh, grass hoppers. I have uh, toad. I have snake. I have snake. I have uh, hawk. I have a lion. Now, what do you think can also feed on? Okay. Uh, grass. Okay, let me let me add this one. Rabbits. Please let me explain this arrow. This arrow does not mean that. It is a grasshopper that is feeding on the totem. I told you the organism feeds on the one before it. So gra grasshoppers feed on grasses. Toad feed on uh, grasshoppers. It continues like that. So here, uh, rabbits feeds on. Okay. Yes, rabbit feeds on grasses. All right. So I will also extend to this place. All right, cats. I've been a rabbit, they eat cats. If you know, say rabbit, they eat cats from a village, I bet. That was the comment session. And let us do a little, let us do a little scientific research. If you know you have seen a rabbit feeding on a cat, please, you are, you, you are free to just drop it, I beg. Because I want to learn, okay? Um, antelope, let me drop it here. Antelope, antelope, antelope. Okay, where should I, okay? Let me bring it this way. Is it like this now? This food, okay? No, no, no. Good. So, this is uh, a short description of what um, the, this a typical food, uh, food web. Should I add more? Let me add more. This hawk, I'll put uh, eagle. Eagle. Alright, eagle feed on hawk. All right, so mm, mm, mm. Uh, antelope also feed on grasses, right? Antelope also feeds on grasses. You see, the arrow is very, very important. Hmm? Then snake, insect. You know, snakes are reptiles, right? Even lizards, okay? Okay, wrong now. See now, so you must be very careful how you place your arrow. It is a snake feeding on the insect, and not the insect feeding on snakes, alright? So, um, so this is uh, a good example of food chain, alright? Food chain. What about goats? Goats, 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 goats. Goats, goats, goats. Okay. Lion will feed. Lion will feed on rabbits. Alright. And of course, uh, this guy, rabbit will feed on grasses. What about lion? Lion will feed on goats. Goats. I said goats. Is it like this or? So, this is a typical food web, all right? Network of interconnected food chain is called a food web. That is for that, so we are done with it. Now, under the ecological concept, under the ecological concept, hmm? now, it's all called biosphere, Biosphere is uh, the thin outer layer of the Earth's surface, the thin outer layer of the Earth's surface capable of supporting lives. It is a thin layer, uh, it is the thin outer layer of the Earth's surface that is capable of supporting life. That is, it is a layer where life can persist. It is a region where 
uh, where uh, plants and animals can actually what? Survive. Please, the region inside the biosphere where communities of life exist is called what? Biome. Biome is a community found inside the biosphere where life can actually exist. In other words, I will say that the collection or assemblage of communities is called biome. Assemblage of population is called what? Communities. All right. Population means the, the, the total number of organisms, the total number of same species of organisms found in a particular geographical area, all right, at a given period of what time. But when two or more populations are assemblaged or are collected, it becomes what a community. Then when two or more communities are collected or assemblaged, you call that what a biome. So the biome is a region inside the biosphere where life can actually what exist. Mm -hmm. Now the subdivisions of the biosphere where they are not living substance are the lithosphere, the hydrosphere, and the uh, atmosphere. So, lithosphere, hydrosphere, and atmosphere are the subdivisions of the biosphere, all right? Lithosphere, hydrosphere, and atmosphere are the subdivisions of the biosphere. Do you understand that? Now, as it implies, L for land, L for waiting in land, the solid layer of the earth crust is called what? Lithosphere. The solid layer of the earth crust is called what? Lithosphere. The, as the name implies, hydro, water, water, hydro, water, water. Hydro means water. Alright? So, the liquid part of the earth is called what? Hydrosphere. The liquid part of the earth is called hydrosphere. Take note of that. It is very, very important. Now the atmosphere is that part of the is that part of the earth that is made up of what gases. It is that part of the earth that is made up of what gases. That is made up of what gases. And this atmosphere extends three thousand five hundred kilometer from the earth. All right, it extends three thousand five hundred kilometers. From the earth, but at the lower region where you have 8 to 15 kilometers, and that is where you have the troposphere. The troposphere is where life is what? Is uh, where life exists to be specific. Now in the atmosphere you have you have gases. Alright, the atmosphere is made up of different gases. Okay. Now we have oxygen. Oxygen is 21% by volume. Nitrogen is uh, 70. Uh, is it 78 now? Okay, 78% by volume. Now, please, the presence of nitrogen in the atmosphere plays a crucial role. All right, the presence of nitrogen in the atmosphere reduces what corrosion, corrosion, and what. Combustion. The presence of nitrogen in the atmosphere reduces corrosion and combustion. Therefore, it acts as a diluent. It acts as what? Diluent. Okay? Now, what about uh, carbon four oxide? Carbon four oxide. Alright, 0.03%. Alright, you now have water vapor. And rare or inert or unreactive gases or noble gases. So these are the constituents of the atmosphere. The troposphere, as said, is that region that is just 
is, is in no region of the atmosphere where life can actually, can actually exist and it's about 10 to 15 kilometers at the lower region of the atmosphere which is about 3,500 kilometers. So that is all about the lithosphere, the hydrosphere and the atmosphere. Please take note of something. I told you that the region in the biosphere where life can actually exist or where life can persist is called biome. It's called what? Biome. Is that not correct? Now, biome can actually be biome found in the biosphere can actually be determined by several factors. The bio can actually be determined by several factors. And these factors are climatic factors. All right. Uh, uh, okay. Radiation. Okay. Solar radiation it receives. Solar uh, radiation it receives and pattern of rainfall and uh, temperature. So these are the three factors that can determine the biome of what? Biosphere. They'll ask you which of the following factors cannot be used to determine bio, please. Climatic factors, solar radiation, that is the amount of sunlight it receives, and pattern of rainfall and temperature affect bio. Take note of that. Apart from these factors, an environment or the, the, the biome, all right, the, the environments found in the biome can actually be uh, categorized into uh, you have a uh, shrublands, all right, deserts, deserts, you have a uh, grasslands, grasslands, um, we have a uh, deciduous forest, and you have what? Coniferous forest. Please let me check if it's recording. Excuse me. Yeah, it's recording. Yes, I have to check. Yes, you don't understand. So, I said there are three factors that determine a uh, biome, or uh, yeah, factors that can be used to determine the biome. I said we have a uh, pattern of rainfall and temperature. Uh, solar, uh, that is solar radiation it receives, and of course, climatic conditions. All right. But environmental biome can be grouped into shrublands, deserts, grasslands, deciduous forests, and what? Coniferous forests. Please take note, it is very, very important. And we need, we need. Please, the. Or I can say that the, there is uh, the distinctiveness, that is the word used in a textbook. The distinctiveness of the biome can be determined by those three factors I mentioned. Climatic factors, path of rainfall and temperature, and solar radiation received. So they are the factors that can be used to determine the distinctiveness of a particular biome. All right? But the indistinct boundaries, the indistinct boundaries, where plants, where dom, uh, dominant plants, where dominant plants meet, that is where they mix, all right? The indistinct boundaries, where dominant plants uh, meet in order to form almost continuous gradient, is called which of these? A. Lithorazole, Lithorazole. B. Estuary. All right. C. I'll give you, okay, holocrine. D. 
echo prime e echo climb. So what is the answer? Confusion, confusion. <laughs> there you go, you go shock. All right, so the, the indistinct boundaries where dominant plants mix to form almost continuous gradients is called which of these? Is it litora? Is it estuary? Is it holocrine? Echocrine or echocline? Please, the answer is... <laughs> so what do you think the answer is? <laughs> Or should I leave it so you drop it on the comment section? So please, that boundary is where dominant plants meet or mix. It's called what? Echocrine. Look at option D and E. Take notes. If you should pick this, it can lead to nightmares. Pick this, it will lead to flawless success. So please, it is what? Echocline. Very, very important. So shall we continue? All right, so, uh, so these are, I've given the factors that can be used to, this, to determine the distinctiveness of a particular biome. And I said that is, uh, the biome communities uh, can be grouped into a shrub, but there's shrublands, deserts, grasslands, deciduous forests, and what coniferous forests. Or when you may be asking, oh God, what is the meaning of all these terms here? Shrublands, desert, grassland, deciduous forest, and coniferous forest. Just as let me imply shrublands, lands that are occupied with shrubs. All right. So my major concern right now is desert, grassland, deciduous forest, and what coniferous forest. So let me start with what desert. Desert is a region that is that is uh, made up of or uh, the characteristics of desert include low rainfall, yeah, low rainfall, like low rainfall, extreme hot temperature, Right, an environment that is extremely hot is called what a desert. All right, the rainfall in desert is about 25 or 30 meter. All right, 25 30 meter. All right, take note of that. Mm, that's per year, that's yearly. Now, please let me let me uh say something here. Yes, the desert has a very high hot uh, temperature. Please take note that during the day. The temperature is very high, leading to what? Low humidity. During the day, the temperature is very, which means during the day, there is high temperature and low what? Humidity. But at night, at night, there is what? Low temperature and high humidity, which means that at night, it will be very, very what? Cold. All right. So, Despite the fact that there is low rainfall in this region, there are certain uh, plants that can actually survive in this uh, region. All right, these plants, some are called a drought, drought resistant seed, drought resistant what seed. All right, now some plants. There's all called desert honey. Okay, is it okay? Sorry, tony, tony, desert tony plants. Why are they called desert tony plants? This plant they have thorns. Now the thorns presence help them to that is to reduce water towards transpiration and what evaporation. Which means that in desert there is what high evaporation because there is what high temperature. Hmm? Learn for extreme uh, hot temperature. All right, high uh, high humidity at night and low temperature at night. There is high evaporation. That is the reason these plants have to possess stones is to regulate or control the amount of water that is being lost 
through transpiration, that is gas, and through a liquid called gotation, all right? So please take note of that. When a plant loses water in the form of uh, gas, you call it what trans uh, transpiration, and it's measured using an instrument called what photometer. But if a plant loses water in the form of liquid, it is called what gotation. But when the plant loses water in the form of liquid and uh, gas, gas is called what evapotranspiration. Evapotranspiration. So these are plants that can actually survive in this type of environment. Please, another name for this environment is called arid environment or arid regions. Arid regions. These regions are very, very hot. Arid regions. Desert or arid regions. Okay? Now, there are also um, plants, also that there are some animals that can actually survive properly in this region. Please, cactus. Cactus is another plant that can survive in this environment. Okay? Then, even plants that have long taproot system. Trees that have long tap root system can actually survive in this hot in this hot region because their tap root goes down into the soil, trap water and take it upward the plant. Take note of that. So, what are some examples of animals that can survive in this kind of uh, hot environment? What are these animals? Please, animals include uh, jack rabbits. Jack rabbits can survive in this region, all right? Uh, kangaroo, kangaroo can survive in this region. Uh, rats can survive in this region, all right? Um, on the ground squirrel, on the ground squirrels, can survive in this region as well. All right. Now some birds. Some birds can also survive in this region. These birds are vultures. Vultures. Um. Cati wren. All right. Turkeys. All of these can survive in deserts. Right. You now I also have large numbers of reptiles, large numbers of reptiles like lizards and snakes. They can actually survive in this region. You now have a few species of frogs and what? Toads. Frogs and toads are collectively called what? Amphibians. Amphibians. Because they can live in water and moist land. I did not say, I said moist land, okay? The large, large variety, large variety of insects can actually survive in this region as well, as well as arachnids. Arachnids, large variety of insects and arachnids can survive in this region, okay? Um, another bird that can also survive in this region is what is called the burrowing bird. The burrowing birds. All right? Burrowing birds. So that is all about desert. I believe it's clear enough. Arid region, high temperature, low, rainf uh, low uh, rainfall. Uh, at night, the temperature is actually low, leading to what? High humidity. But during the day, there's low humidity and high temperature. There's high evaporation or what? Transpiration. So I've given us plants and animals that can actually survive in this type of world. Please, this, this, the plants that are found adapting in this hot environment, they have reduced leaves. They have reduced leaves. All boil down to regulating the loss of what? Of water. Please, take note of that. The next one is grasslands. Grasslands. As the name implies, grasslands. What does that tell you? It is, the, it, it is a region that is full of grasses. 
there are no trees, grasses all through. Now, grasslands are divided into two. It's all called tropical grassland. Tropical grassland. This tropical glass, uh, grassland is also called savanna. All right, savanna is another name for tropical grassland. And you have number two called um, temperate, temperate grassland. Temperate grass within land. So these are the two divisions of grasslands. Tropical grassland, otherwise called savanna, then temperate grassland. Now, what are the characteristics of savanna or tropical grassland? And these guys, they have, uh, they have scattered, they have scattered trees. They have scattered trees, and this savanna covers half of Africa, half regions in Africa, all right? So which means that it occupies a very large area in Africa. The, that is, uh, the region of Africa where this savanna, or where, where the savanna occupies the most is the Central Africa. Central Africa. All right, Central Africa, Australia, Australia, India, um, South America. The region in uh, Africa where savanna is found dominating it is specifically Central Africa. Then others such as Australia, India, and what South America. So please take note of that. It covers almost 500, 5 million, 5 million of square miles. Square miles, all right? You see, it covers a, like, a very large area of what? Africa and other countries in which it is what found just as i mentioned okay now the next one is what tropic they'll ask you which of the following is uh not okay which of the following is savanna grassland not located this 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 okay this 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 and this so please take note of that now the temperate grassland is made up of grasses all right or what vegetations Grasses or what? Vegetations, okay? Grasses or vegetations. There are no trees and there are no shrubs. So which means that shrubs and trees are absent in tropical in, in temperate grasslands. Which of these which of the following which of the following regions is made up of individual scattered trees? It is called what? Tropical grassland. I believe it is clear enough. So the next one is the next one is deciduous forest. Deciduous forest. Now, please, the characteristics of this forest are one. Now, the trees found in this forest they have broad leaves. We have waiting broad leaves. They have broad leaves and they have the ability to shed their leaves. They shed their leaves or shed leaves or their leaves, yes, in winter. That is Amata. During Amata, they shed their leaves. So please, the Zidus Red Forest, or the Resort Forest, is characterized by broad leaves and the ability to shed their leaves, okay? So please take note of that. What are some examples of uh, trees found here? They are the oak and beech. Oak and beech are examples of uh, trees that can actually shed their leaves and they also have what? broad leaves. I believe it's clear enough. Now the next one is what? Coniferous 
forests. Coniferous. <laughs> well, okay, coniferous forest, as the name implies, all right, it is characterized by flexible branches. The branches are what flexible, and these trees they can withstand freezing. Please, oh, these are the features, oh, it is very, very important. Please, the type of regions where the plants can withstand uh, freezing and they have flexible branches is called which of these, please, coniferous forests. They can, they can withstand freezing and they have flexible, uh, flexible uh, branches. Examples of plants or trees other days, you have, you have the pine, we have fir, we have cedar, and we have spruce. So all of these are found in a coniferous forest. So I believe it's clear enough. Just follow it this way, it will be very, very simple. So another one I will be introducing is the tropical uh, rainforest. Though I did not write it out, but I have to include it. Tropical rainforest. Tropical rainforest. This tropical rainforest, let me write it out. Tropical rainforest. Tropical rainforest. Now they have high rainfall. They have high rainfall. Uh, they have um, high and low, uh, high and constant temperature. And temperature is about um, 17 degrees Celsius and it is 63 degrees Fahrenheit. All right. And rainfall is about um, 250 centimeter and 800 uh, inches. All right. So please, that is that is the amount of rainfall in a year there is a high and constant temperature high rainfall all right so and this uh, rainforest has a little seasonal seasonal what variations all right Sis little seasonal what variation so please take note of that and this region is also called is also called cold region, right? It's actually cold because of the high amount of what rain fall. So that is all you have to note about these guys, all right? Nice. Okay. Good. 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 Oh. 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 Yes. This. Uh. This rainforest. Um. How do I put it now? Do I put it? How do I put it? Has uh, leaves that are green, all right. Green leaves, evergreen leaves. Okay, so please take note of that. It is very, very important. So I believe we are done with this. We are done. Like, don't forget the terms are giving us exocline or whatever client. All right. So we are done. We are done. Eh? So the next one we are going to be discussing is terrestrial and aquatic environment oh oh oh, oh. what have you given us so far hmm? other tropical rainforest deciduous desert grassland or whatever they are under aquatic they are under terrestrial environments i would have written it before listing them out they are under terrestrial waiting environment terrestrial environment so please take note of their characteristics very very important mm -hmm. now the next one is what aquatic environment aquatic waiting environment in aquatic environment we shall be discussing fresh waters fresh water oceans Fresh water, examples of fresh water are ponds, lakes, rivers, 
uh, streams streams um, yes and waters now all of these are called inland waters what did I say inland waters inland waters please the study of inland water is called limnology limnology the study of inland water is called what? limnology examples of fresh waters are examples of fresh water habitats or environments are ponds lakes rivers streams and whatever mm -hmm. now fresh water is at it has a very low ppt of about 0 0.5 parts per thousand Please, this is not percent. Look at the sign here. Hmm? This sign connotes PPT. Please, this PPT here does not mean precipitate. Uh, it stands for parts per thousand. So this is a unit of salinity. What is the meaning of salinity? Salinity means what the degree of saltiness that is present in a given water body. All right. The degree of salt or the quantity of salt or the amount of salt that a given water comprises, you call it what? Salinity. All right? The word saline, salt. Now, fresh water has low salinity of 0 0.5 parts per thousand. Therefore, it is safe for drinking. If you should drink it, do not kill you. Unlike oceans and seas, try to do not live to tell the story. So please, uh, so that is what we have. It means that this, this type of water can sustain lives, right? Animals and plants thrive in this type of water because of its what? Low salinity. Though we also have some animals that are best adaptive to uh, saline environment. As time goes on, we get to uh, do justice to that. So that is what? Fresh water. Um, is there another one that I have to uh, drop right now? Okay, fresh water. We are, we are, okay, fresh water. We are done with fresh water, right? We are done with fresh water. Are we done with fresh water? Okay, good, 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 good. That, that reminds me. Fresh water is then divided into two. Okay, fresh water is divided into two subdivisions. We have the lotic water. Please take notes. The lotic water is also called running water. Running water, let me say the girl let it run. No, not the, not say the run. It's not going anywhere. I will explain. Come on, see what's this word now? Running water. You say, hey, what happened the girl let go? No, it's not running. It's like saying uh, flowing water, okay? Flowing water, running water. Another name for running water is called what? lotic water. What are the features of this lotic water? They have high, the water uh, flows at high velocity and there's what? High oxygen, uh, high dissolve oxygen, high dissolve oxygen. All right, high dissolve oxygen. So it means that animals can actually uh, strive in this uh, region. Then you have the lenthic water. Lenthic water is also called a static water. It is just found, it is not running, it's just there. Alright? Now, the opposite of lotic water is called lenthic water. So, if lotic water has high velocity, it means that lentic water has what low velocity. If lot if lotic water has high dissolved oxygen, it means that lentic water has low dissolved oxygen. Very easy, all right. So that is what we have it to be. Now there are see see listen. There are animals that are best adapted right to the bottom of the water. Right, that is, they are found adapting at the seabed. Seabed, uh, no, the seabed here yeah, is not, it's not more careful, eh? it's, 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 it's not more careful, just like the floor of the water. So, the 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 that is the floor of the water or the bottom of the water or seabed is called the benthic zone. 
perfect zone. It's called what? The perfect zone. Now, this vertex zone is actually called what? Seabed of the fur uh, or the, the bottom of the water or the floor of what? The water. Good. Animals that are found. I can also say that vertex, what vertex zone means substratum of the water, all right? Animals found in this vertex zone are called waiting bentos. Animals found in this zone are called what? Bentos. There are several divisions or classification of bentos. Of course, you don't need it. Let me just give it. We have the mild bentos. The mild bentos. We have the micro bentos. And we have the macro waiting bentos. You don't need this ones. You don't need this ones, okay? Just take note that animals that are found at the bottom of the water. Right. Are called what? Bentos. Examples, of course, are snails, mussels, and even polyps of Nigerians. Okay? Then you have uh, some uh, insects and larvae. Alright? Um, of course, okay, I've written snail. Alright? Crustaceans. Crustaceans. All of these can be classified as what? Bentos. Even annelids. Annelids. You know, annelids are called what? Segmented worms. They are all bentos because they are found at the bottom of the water. All right? So, what about organisms that are called active swimmers? Organisms that are called active swimmers. In the sense that they are not affected by the water current, they have the ability, all right, to to, that, to stabilize themselves in the water or on the water. These active swimmers are called nectin. Active swimmers, they are called what? Nectin. Nectin. Please, you don't add s, plural or singular. You don't say nectin. Alright, you, you know, say there are over millions of nectins in, in the water body. No, please, it's wrong. Nectin singular, nectin plural. Alright, active swimmers are called nectin, alright, such as fishes, alright. You know, also have uh, 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 that is weak, weak swimmers, that is plants that float, they float, and there are some animals that, they, that are weak swimmers. All of these are called plankton, all right? Weak plants and animals swimming, all right, are called what? plankton, not plankton, irrespective of whether it's plural or singular, as I've explained. Happy swimmers and nectin, weak swimmers are called plankton. Now, what's, what, what's called zooplankton, all right? Animal-like plankton, they fight to plant, all right? So, that is for that concerning fresh water. The next one is ocean. Ocean. How would you describe the ocean? How would you describe the ocean? Mm. Oh, please, please. The ocean. Oh, mm, 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 okay. Let me write it out. Ocean. Ocean covers a very large area of the Earth crust. A very large area of about 71%. And this uh, and the ocean has has about 200,000 200, species. Alright, 200,000 species of unicellular organisms, unicellular medicine organisms. Plants and other animals, all right? It has over 200,000 species. In the cellular organisms, plants, and what? Animals, all right? Please, about 98%, about 98% um, of the aforementioned organisms, bentos. Bent and uh, bentos occupy 90% of the organisms found in um 
found in um, the ocean, right? As I've mentioned, but two percent are found in a vast open ocean. Now, please, another name for open ocean is called what? The pelagic zone. The pelagic within zone. Now, this pelag pelagic zone is made up of, uh, it's also called a uh, uh, photic zone, all right? As I, I can also call it photic zone because it is a region where there's what? High as this. This region is where supplied with what? Sunlight. It has lots of sunlight. If there's lots of sunlight in this zone, what does that tell you? It means that it supports what? Photosynthetic. Yeah. It supports what? Photosynthetic activities. All right. It supports what? Photosynthetic activities. All right. So please take note of that. It is very, very important. Now, this ocean has a lot of strata. I'll call it, it is made up of a lot of provinces or stratification, stratification or stratas or divisions as the case may be. That is, is divided into different strata based on what light penetration and other what criteria. Now, what are these strata? What? Please, I just remembered something. Oh God. Okay, let me now pause this. Let me continue. Let me continue. Now, there's what we call littoral zone. Another name for this littoral zone is called what? Intertidal zone. Interweighting tidal zone. Now, this littoral zone is actually the region. Where uh, land and water meet, it is a region where land and water meet. It is a meeting point or region of light and sea water to be specific. Not just water, no, I'm not talking of fresh water, like sea water. It's a region where land and sea water meet. All right, now this region. Is actually said to be the richest and harshest. If is if it's said to be the richest and uh, the richest and harshest, what does that tell you? It means that based on its richness, it has lots of dissolved nutrients. Then based on harsh is its its harsh in nature. It means that there are other factors that affect it negatively. All right, so it means that the animals found in this region uh, are affected by its harshness. All right, what are these harsh uh, factors that affect the organisms in this littoral or in, or in tidal zone? All right, they are called they are fluctuations, fluctuations, pounding. Pounding, soft, uh, wind, sun, hot temperature. Please let me use a let me use a better language for this littoral zone. This littoral zone is called the shoreline. Shoreline, right? It is a shoreline. Uh, it's it's just the edge. Is the edge shoreline, all right? The bank, okay, let me use that word the bank of the water, all right? The bank of what the water, the mid region of land and sea water is called what the littoral zone and it's called what the shoreline, all right? So, this uh, this region supports uh, it has nutrients, of course. I think it is the richest, it has nutrients, it supports. Uh, uh, it supports photosynthetic activities because it has what sunlight present in it. All right, it has sunlight present in it. And examples of animals that can actually 
of that can actually survive this era are uh, the, the, the barnacles, the crustaceans, the snails, mussels, and whatever. All of them are found in this region. Now, below the littoral zone, all right, below this littoral zone is called another zone, and this zone is called what? Subtidal zone. So, tidal zone. All right, so tidal zone. Now, the, what do, this word, so tidal, what does that mean? So, it is under the word intertidal zone. So means under, so it is under what? Intertidal zone, all right? It also has nutrients, all right, and it supports the activities of what? Uh, photosynthetic what? Organisms, all right? So, uh, which one again? Which one again? Which one again? Which one again? Okay, we now have uh, the neuretic. We have the neuretic, the neuretic or shallow water zone. Neuretic or shallow water zone. Now, this neuretic zone has a lot of nutrients. Of course, they, they all have nutrients in them, and they have. Uh, Different organisms surviving in there, right? It is very, very important. Please note, note, the semi, the semi-enclosed zone or transitional zone, the semi-enclosed tra transitional zone, all right, we have a fresh water where fresh water flows into sea water into sea water is called estuary the semi enclosed transitional zone Fresh water flows into sea water. It's called what? Estuary. Please, oh, it is very, very important. The meeting point of uh, the region where land and sea water meet, littoral zone. The region where fresh water flows into sea water is called what? Estuary. Another name for this estuary is called what? Brackish water. Brackish. Brackish water, water. All right, please take note of that. Um, another region of this zone is called the pelagic zone. Now, this pelagic zone, I've told us, is also called what? Open ocean. Please, open ocean. Now, this pelagic, this pelagic uh, zone, there's a word that I love about this zone. It is called zone that is impoverished biologically that is impoverished rather impoverished biologically all right the pelagic also called open ocean all right is said to be impoverished biologically what is the meaning of this word it means that it has a reduced amount of nutrients. It has a reduced amount of what? Nutrients. In the sense that when an animal dies in this zone, what happens? It watches from the photic zone. It watches from the photic zone to the partiza zone. All right. Photic zone is a region where there is high, uh, where, where there is, that is where illuminated with light. So it's also called what? Uh, zone of illumination. It is where illuminated with light. So it means that uh, green plants can actually strive properly on that zone. So please, it is impoverished biologically because when an animal dies, it leaves the 
plastic so the nutrient is carried down to the baptizer zone please in the baptizer zone they are immobilized immobilizing lies the in the baptizer zone the nutrients get settled that is why it is said to be what impoverished biologically i believe it's clear enough now there are two there are several divisions of the pelagic zone all right there are subdivisions of the pelagic zone we have the epipelagic and this epipelagic is below the surface of the water is below the surface of the water i know as well what mesopelagic this mesopelagic is also called what twilight zone twilight these are the kind of questions a you ask which of the following is also called twilight zone it is called what mesopelagic zone all right then it receives dim light if it receives dim light it means that it does not support photosynthetic activities that is to say the amount of sunlight that enters into the zone is very very small it is what very very small now apart from that apart from that based on light penetration we have three zones we have the photic zones we have the aphotic zone aphotic zone and we have within this photic zone oh, okay I, i'm not done with okay now epipelagic i said the pelagic is divided into, into three epipelagic mesopelagic and batizazo so please take note that the darkest part of the water is the part that is very close to the seabed to the bottom of what the water please the bot that is the the darkest part of the water is divided into um into batiza zone abyssa zone and uh, is it a halo okay um halo zone something like that all right so these are the three zones that that the pelagic pelagic zone is made up of all right hado yes hado pelagic good hado pelagic hado pela hado pelagic all right so please which of the following is the uh, which of the following is not among the darkest parts of the sea if they should include epipelagic that becomes the answer if they should include any of this that becomes the answer please the photic zone is a region i've explained where there's what light illumination a uh, large quantity of light is found in this zone so it means that plants can actually photosynthesize then a photic zone little quantity of light is found in this zone and that's of course same thing okay darkest zone no no sunlight at all so it means that photosynthetic organisms cannot survive in this zone okay that is for that which i think good before i rub off the board or before i call it a day they i would have given us a term it just occurred to me right now and that term is called tundra 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 is a term that is used to connote or denote extreme cold environment extreme cold within environments such as the arctic regions now these regions are extremely within cold they are extremely cold owing to the fact that this region is quite cold and the environment tends to be frozen it means that plants found in this environment they are short lived about 60 days they can only survive within 60 days however however there are some plants that can actually survive in this zone 
you have what is called woody dwarf plants woody dwarf plants all right sedges certain grasses and um, lichens now these guys they can survive properly in the tundra tundra is a term that is used to connote extreme cold environments also called arctic regions these regions are likely to be frozen which with that, with that fact it means that plants are short-lived right plants that cannot actually adapt to the coldness of this environment tend to have a very uh, short lifespan within 60 days but there are some stubborn ones that can actually survive in this region woody dwarf plants sedges grasses and lichens and some birds some birds can actually survive in this region that is all about this part so in our next class i'm going to be taking us community which means the assemblage of populations then from there we take population and factors affect population like size mortality uh, that is natality birth rate which increases population mortality death rate which decreases population we now have sex ratio proportion of okay like, like age ratio proportion of male to female or sex ratio proportion of male to female as the case may be we now also have a okay age let's use sex ratio for a proportion of male to female okay now we now have age based on age we now have different types of population or different types of reproductions okay we have the pre-reproductives the post-reproductives and the pre and the reproductives reproductives pre-reproductives and post-reproductives if i want to place it sequentially it is arranged as uh, pre-reproductives reproductives and post reproductives so in our next class we, will, we are going to be treating the impact of these reproductives on a particular population we need to s curve graph otherwise called sigma graph or a j-shaped graph subscribe so that when i upload new content you'll be notified by youtube do have a wonderful day